and welcome to the Alaska SQL User Group. My name is Greg Burns, and this is the July 2014 meeting of the Alaska SQL User Group. Today, our guest presenter will be Ryan Adams, who will be uh, talking about managing your shop with a central management server and using policy-based management. <laughs> okay, so um, today our agenda is uh, Ryan is going to be speaking, um, and uh, just for information, the user group meetings are generally held on the second Thursday of every month. Uh, we have in-person and uh, meetings here at the uh, office of uh, Network Business Systems in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, we also broadcast this via WebEx, and uh, we record these meetings and put them up on our YouTube channel. Uh, next month, a uh, guy named Martin Kearney is going to be um, broadcasting from Australia and telling us about how to manage SQL Server using all the built-in tools. Uh, SQL has a lot of built-in tools that are underappreciated, and he's going to be giving them some love. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to Network Business Systems for providing this WebEx and this meeting space. Thanks, MBS. So, uh, first I wanted to go over some PASS slides. Uh, the PASS Summit is coming up here pretty quick, and uh, uh, members of the Alaska SQL User Group are entitled to a $150 off of registration. So let me know, I can get you that, that registration code. Uh, PASS also has a number of virtual chapters uh, that meet, you know, they have a global audience, and uh, they have lots and lots of different topics. And so the meetings coming up here are in these are the June meetings, so those are, nope, that was mislabeled. These, these are all the July meetings, uh, and they got uh, meetings for business intelligence, virtualization, um, data architecture, and business analytics. Uh, by the way, Ryan is a uh, chapter leader of one of the uh, past virtual chapters, so uh, maybe he'll tell us about his chapter. Uh, there's some SQL Saturdays coming up. Um, None of them in Alaska, obviously, but that might change. I might uh, organize a SQL Saturday here in Anchorage uh, someday soon. Um, if you'd like to sign up for a free membership at uh, sqlpass.org, uh, you can hit on you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, at the web, uh, even Twitter. So now our feature presentation, Ryan Adams, is going to be uh, talking about how to manage your shop with CMS and policy-based management. So, uh, Ryan, would you like to tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, so I, I live in Texas, uh, and I help run one of the past chapters down here in the Dallas, Texas area. Um, and, and like you said, I, I, the, I do the performance virtual chapter. This is actually a really good time to talk about it. So we meet once a month. But next month, we do what we call an annual performance palooza. And, of course, everything we talk about is performance-based, but we're doing eight back-to-back -back sessions all in a row. I've got some really great speakers lined up, like Alan White, Kevin Klein. We've got some fantastic stuff going on. So uh, if you get a chance, hit performance.sequelpass.org uh, and check us out. We've got some really good stuff going on. Um, we haven't actually posted the schedule yet. I'm still working on the timings of everything, but we'll get that posted soon. So definitely worth checking out. Um, and I'm pretty highly involved with PASS. I'm a regional mentor, so I help all the user group leaders in the South Central area of the United States uh, run their their uh, user groups and, and, and things like that. So um, I work for Verizon. I've worked there for about 15 years. I've done a lot of different stuff in those 15, 16 years that I've been there. Uh, I started off doing desktop stuff, server stuff, everything in between. Uh, right before I got into SQL Server, I actually did Active Directory, and I actually designed and architected their Active Directory worldwide. Uh, and the group I work on now does a lot of identity management stuff. Uh, so I handle all the database backends for that. Um, some of it's custom stuff that we have. Uh, some of it is uh, you know some vendor apps that we have in order to help manage our identities within the company. I handle all the databases on the back end of that. So uh, that's kind of what I do now. All right. So obviously today we're going to talk about policy-based management, central management server. So I do blog on RyanJAdams.com. So you guys can go out there and have my blog. I do talk about. Um, I do a lot of high availability disaster recovery stuff and uh, some, some PBM and CMS stuff as well. Uh, if you're on Twitter, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter. I post all my blog posts and stuff out there and actively talk about these things on Twitter as well. So uh, make sure you go follow me if you're on Twitter. Um, I do speak frequently. Uh, I've spoken on SQL Crews and Dev Connections. I spoke at the past summit last year. I'll actually be, I was privileged enough to be able to speak again this year. Uh, so I will be speaking this year as well various SQL Saturdays and things like that. 
So here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start off with central management server. The first thing we're going to talk about is configuration. Where do I find it? What does it look like? What does it do for me? And then we're going to look at importing and exporting. Uh, the real advantage behind importing and exporting is it means that I don't have to redo stuff over and over again. I can take a configuration. I can move it from one server to another. More importantly, if you're using it locally, it means that I can export it into a CMS. That way I don't have to recreate all those connection objects all over again. That'll make a little bit more sense when we get into it. Then we'll talk about uh, policy-based management from there. Uh, and just so you guys know, I always talk about these two things together. I, I've considered separating them before, but they work together so well, it's almost hard to have one without the other. Uh, CMS, uh, when you get toward the end, you'll see how it makes policy-based management far more extensible than how it was designed out of the box. So it really kind of gives it a whole other platform and engine to run on top of that just makes it a little bit more extensible in our environments than what we would normally get. Uh, so we'll talk about how to create policies first, and we'll talk about how to evaluate them. So once I find these policies and these settings that I want my servers to look like, how do I make sure that my server actually complies to that? If for some reason it happens to fail, and it happens to, uh, you know, I evaluate the policy and one of them is non-compliant, how do I get alerted? I want to know about that. I don't want to uh, just have this magically disappear into uh, the ether. I want to make sure that I get some type of alert that tells me, hey, uh, something violated this policy, so that's something that I can go take a look at and address. And then I'm just going to do a little bit on reporting. I'm not going to get in depth on there, but I just want you to know about a reporting project that's available for you. It's, it's really, really handy. So starting off with central management server, the idea here is that this is just, if you open up Management Studio, we will here in a minute, and you look at your registered servers, you can register multiple servers in Management Studio. Well, that's great, but the problem is that it's local. It's only good for you. Well, that's fine and dandy if I'm the only DBA around. That's not so great if I happen to have 10 or 15 DBAs on a team because now if I happen to decommission a server or I, I uh, have a new server that comes up, i got to send an email out to the group. Everybody has to go open up Management Studio on their laptops, desktops, whatever, and they've got to add or remove those connections. As you can tell, over time, you can imagine they're going to get out of sync. But if we store everything in one central location and everybody accesses that location, then we can make the changes there and everybody sees the same thing all the time. It's much easier to manage that way because now we only have to make those changes one time and not rely on everybody to keep it up for themselves. That's what a CMS gives us, a central place to put all these connections to our servers that everyone can connect to and make use of. One thing I always want to point out to you is that all of these, uh, when you host them on a CMS, this stuff's hosted in MSDB. So if all this stuff's hosted in MSDB, what I want you to remember is, is you want to make sure you're backing it up. You should be doing it anyway because of so many different things that get stored in MSDB. But if you're not and you're going to use CMS, make sure you back it up because if you lose it, all your connection objects are gone. You got to start all over again. Now, everything has some requirements, and Central Management Server does. So it was new with SQL Server 2008, which means that if you're going to make a Central Management Server, it has to be on 08 or above. However, that only means that the CMS has to be on 08 or above, not the connections that you register. So you can register connections to SQL Server 2000 and 2005 and add those in. It's just the CMS itself that has to be on an 08 or up. Other cool thing, it's supported on Express Edition. So for some reason, and supportability-wise, I hope we're past 2005, but I'll admit I just got one of my last SQL 2000 instances. I have several 2005s around. If for some reason you don't have an 08 or above, it's supported on Express. So we don't have to go out there burning a license. You know, we know the licensing got much higher with 2012 when they went to Percore. We don't have to worry about that just for a little CMS. You can host that on an Express edition. So that's kind of handy. Now, because everything's stored in MSDB, access to the central management server is handled through roles in MSDB. There's only two of them, so it's really simple. 
they're really self-explanatory. The first one's our server group administrator role. That allows me to do pretty much anything. It's the God role, right? So I can actually disable the CMS. I can turn it off. I can yank connection objects. I can delete entire groups of connection objects. I can add them, alter them, whatever. But the server group reader role is maybe I have one guy that's you know, my team lead or one or two of my lead DBAs that are in the administrator role. But everybody else from my junior DBAs, they don't really need to be able to change all that stuff. They just need to be able to see it and make use of it. And so we put them in the reader role, which means that they can see them, they can use them, but that's it. They, there's no changes. They can't do anything like that. Now, there's a few advantages here. Now, we've already talked about the first one, and that's a repository that we can use for everyone, which is great. So now we have the central location where all these connection objects are stored in. The other neat thing it allows us to do is that we can actually run a query against multiple servers simultaneously. So it's not a single thread. Some people think, oh, it's a single thread. It's going to go hit each server, server one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't. It's actually multi-threaded, so it'll open up the connection to every one of those boxes and run them simultaneously. That's a really cool thing for us to be able to do. It can also be a very dangerous thing for us to be able to do. And I'll show a little bit about why that is in a demo in a minute. It also allows me to group servers logically. Now, I have some examples listed here. And the reason I list the various different examples and what I really want to implore upon you is when you design this, because and this is just putting stuff in folders. This is just organizational stuff. But what I really want to encourage you to do is to always model that around your business. Okay, so if I have a group of DBAs on the east coast of the United States that handles all the servers over there, then I might want an east and a west and a central, or however I've divided that up. That might make sense if that's how my business and my support model works. But if, for example, it is based upon application support, and I've got two DBAs that support this app and five DBAs that support this other application, regardless of where the servers are, well, then doing it geographically doesn't make any sense anymore. It's going to be easier for you to group them based upon the application. So kind of think about that. And we can get granular. You can do folders under folders, right? So maybe this application has got... Uh, you know, 30 servers in it, and some of them are 2000, some of them are 2012. We got a couple 2014s in there. We can separate them out by version underneath that. Uh, maybe we say, look, this app supports, you know, servers on the East Coast and the West Coast. So, you know, we have a folder for the app, but then we have an East and West underneath that. But what I can tell you is, is that no matter how you do it, if you model it after your business, you will thank yourself later. It'll just be easier and make more sense that way. The other cool thing is that we can evaluate policies out of policy-based management against those groups and folders that we create inside of our CMS. And that's the piece that makes PBM a little bit more extensible, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well, why it really wasn't designed that way out of the box. But that is a really handy, cool thing. It's another good reason to actually have a CMS if you don't have one, if for no other reason to be able to uh, evaluate those policies much easier across multiple servers. Now, with everything that has advantages, there's always disadvantages, right? So the CMS server itself can't actually be in a group. So if I create a group or a folder in my CMS, and let's say that my CMS server that I decided to create it on happens to support application number two, and I've got a folder for application number two, and so I go to add the CMS server underneath that folder, a connection to it, you can't do that, at least not by default. So if you go in there and you just right-click and try and do that, it's going to come tell you, hey, you can't add a connection to the CMS because this box is the CMS. And so although it may make some sense, like why would I want to create a connection object if I'm already on the CMS server itself, the reason for that is because it may serve multiple functions. Although it may be a CMS, that's probably not the only thing that it does. CMS is really lightweight. So although you, you could make an express or you could make another you know, SQL server by itself, it's so lightweight. Do you really want to manage another instance of SQL server just for this? So odds are, at least for me, I'm going to host it on a server that's probably already doing something else. It's not going to get nailed by this server. I mean, it's literally a re-operation. After you use a connection object, you're connected to the other server, not the CMS anymore. 
So the light weight, weightness of this is, is just very, very minimal. Uh, so there's a workaround for this, and you'll see that I've marked it here, and it's using the local loopback IP address or a fully qualified domain name. And so the interesting thing here is, and I've got a blog post on this if you want to read it on my blog about exactly how this works, but the short story is that when you go create the, the connection object to your CMS, SQL Server, although there's a few other checks, but the big one that it does is that whatever you run, if you go to that server and you want to select add at server name, Whatever it comes back with, which is going to be the NetBIOS name of your computer, that you cannot use. But you can trick it by resolving it by any other means or method, whether that's a local loopback IP address, whether it's the public IP address, using a fully qualified domain name instead of the NetBIOS name. You could, and I do not encourage this, but for testing purposes, you could go trick it and, and uh, actually make a change in your host file on the local operating system and fool it that way. All of that will work as long as it can resolve that name by anything other than the actual uh, NetBIOS name, what select add at server would come back with, then you can add it. The other kicker here is that registered servers, when you add these connections, can only use Windows authentication. And so I always like to ask, why is that a disadvantage? So I want you to think about that for a second, because what it really means is that I can't add a registered server using SQL auth. Why is that a big thing for me? I mean, the fact that I can't use SQL auth. And for me, what that really means is that if I have something that's in another domain that is not trusted to the same domain that this server is in, talk a little bit of Active Directory here, if they're not and they're separated, or they're behind firewalls, maybe they're in a totally different network for test, maybe they're in a DMZ because they're internet facing or partitioned off from your network somehow, then I can't use Windows authentication. I've got to use SQL auth. You can't add connection objects with SQL all. So unfortunately, if you were in that situation or maybe you had a DMZ, you'd have to create another CMS in the DMZ. So there is a little bit of a drawback there. Importing and exporting. So the cool thing is, is if you're using registered servers today and you want to move everything over to a CMS, you don't have to redo it all over again we can actually export those out of Management Studio, import them into your CMS server, and then everybody can use them. If you happen to have more than one CMS server, and this sounds, this sounds kind of dumb because the idea is to have one CMS server. I'm like, okay, why would I want to export them from one CMS server and then import them into another? Why would I need another CMS server? Well, for me personally, it's just an organizational thing for me. So, my test and dev stuff is in a separate network and a separate untrusted domain. So I can't have a CMS. But if you connect to my production CMS, you'll see that I have test folders for all of my test and dev stuff. And the reason I do that is because I only update the list that I use in production, and then every once in a while, if I need it in test, I'll export it and overwrite it in the test side. That way they both match. I know that if I click on one that's under that test folder or dev folder in production, it's not going to work. I know that if I'm in test or dev and I click something under production, it's not going to work. But it's easier for me to maintain a single list in one place and just import it, export it, and overwrite it than it is to maintain and go update it in two different places. One of the first things I'll look at when I exported these things was what is my exposure when I export them? Because they're exported in an XML format. Well, there's some good news and some bad news depending upon where you, your environment, what company you work at. So if I export a local connection and it's using Windows authentication, the username and password are not exported. So they're not sitting in plain text. That was my big fear was I was going to have usernames and passwords sitting out in plain text in some XML file. Good news is don't need to worry about that with Windows off. SQL auth, if you're using SQL authentication, the username is exported, but the password is hashed. Now, I will tell you that it says that it is encrypted in the XML, and I will show you that file. It is not really encrypted. It is just hashed, which means that it is reversible. It can be undone easier. 
So do keep that in mind. So let's jump into a demo and let's take a look at some of this stuff. <clears throat> All right, now um, this is running on a virtual machine here on my laptop and I have two instances of SQL Server running. So the first one here is demo one, which is just a local default instance. I happen to have a second instance called demo one insta one. It's just a named instance, second instance running on here. Um, for right now, um, actually I'm gonna the connection for insta one. I'm just gonna deal with uh, the demo one default for right now. So the first thing you'll notice when you come into Management Studio is where is CMS at when I'm connected to this? So it's not actually here in Visible by default. We have to go under View, uh, and we'll click Registered Servers. And then when we do that, it adds a second tab over here for Registered Servers. And you'll see here that I have Central Management Server. I can also expand Local Server Group. So this is where um, if I was keeping a list of local ones, and you'll see that I've already got three here. These are local, so these are being stored locally in Management Studio here on my laptop. But I don't have a central management server yet. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, register central management server. So right-click, register. I'm going to use Demo1, my local default instance here, as my central management server. Now you'll notice here this box. The box says I can use Windows authentication. Okay. That's pretty cool, and it's white. It's not grayed out, so I can actually change that to Windows or SQL Auth, which seems kind of weird because a minute ago I told you you couldn't do SQL Auth. Well, I'm not creating a connection object in my CMS. I'm just connecting to the CMS. So in order to connect to the CMS, I can use either one, Windows or SQL, either one. Uh, I'm going to use Windows Authentication here. We'll go ahead and click Save. I'll expand my folder, and then here Demo 1. Now it's, it's empty. And this is the point at which you want to model after your, after your business. So I'm just going to create um, a few groups in here. Uh, let's say I've got one for production. Maybe I've got one for test. Might have one for dev. Oh, I clicked the wrong thing there. I thought that was a connection object as opposed to a group. I clicked the wrong one. It's going to think about that for a minute as it tries to connect to a non-existent server. So what I'm going to do is uh, create another one underneath production. Let's say maybe we, under production we've got east and west coast, right? So we might might do that. I was going to sit there and chew on that for a little bit longer than I was hoping. All right. As soon as it decides, okay. Well, if it would come back to me here, that would be great. That's what I get for clicking the wrong thing. Good. Go away. Let's click the right thing this time. So what I did is I ended up clicking new uh, server registration when I should have clicked new server group here. Go ahead and do dev. So let's say under prod, let's, let's do um, we'll do an east and we'll do a west and move here. So this is, you can kind of see the organizational structure. It's just the folders. You can, you know, structure however you need to uh, form it towards your business. Uh, so then what I want to do uh, now that I've got everything here is actually create some connections. So I'm going to create a new server registration here. And let's register that named instance that I have, demo one, insta one. Now what you'll notice here is that window we saw earlier, it's grayed out now. So we can't change it to SQL authentication here. Windows Auth is the only thing that's allowed for these connections. We'll go ahead and click Save. All right, so we've got a connection there. And let's do one under West. And let's do that for my default instance here, Demo 1. And we'll go ahead and click Save. And I get this nice, beautiful error here. So let's take a look at this error. So the piece I'm really interested in here is this last chunk. You can't add a shared registered server with the same name as the configuration server. So Demo1 is my CMS server, and I'm trying to create a connection called Demo1. 
for demo one. And it says, we can't do that, right? That's the thing I warned you about earlier. Remember, I told you there's a workaround for that. So what I can do is I'll go to new server registration, and I, let's just use a local loopback IP address here, 127.01. Click Save. It'll turn green. Bingo. We're in. So as long as we can resolve it by any way. Now, the negative to this is if I had a bunch of servers, IPs don't look that great. That makes it a little bit more difficult unless you were the kind of guy that just happens to remember tons of IP addresses and matches them to servers in your mind. I am not one of those guys. So if we go and look at the properties of it, and I could have done this when I created it too. I just didn't to show you this. But down here in this bottom box where it says registered server name, we can actually change that. And so I can call it demo one down here. And it's registered server name box right there. Click save and it renames it. So it's just a name, even though it's still using the 127.01 to connect, we can rename it however we want. So that's kind of cool. Now, the next cool thing that we can do is, uh, I told you we can do multi-server uh, queries out of here. Now, wherever I right-click at, it is going to do every server from there now. So if I were to right-click on east and query from here, it's only going to grab demo one instead of one. But if I were to right-click on prod, it would get everything from there on down, which would be both of these guys. So let's do that. Right-click and do new query. Now, a few things to note here when you open up this window, and what we want to pay attention to is the bar down here. The first one says, or the first thing to notice here is the color. Normally, when we open up a connection, it's yellow, but you'll notice it's kind of this uh, pinkish red salmon type color, whatever it is. You'll also notice it says connected to two out of two. So I attempted to connect to two servers, I'm connected to both of them. Now it is possible that one of those servers was down. Let's say I had five servers and then one of them was down, it might have connected to four out of five. That's why you might not see it connect to all of them successfully. Scrolling over, you'll also notice here, this is where I right clicked. That was the folder I right clicked on. So I know from prod folder down is what I connected to. And then, of course, everything else is what you would normally expect. This happens to be the account that I'm connected with, and this is the database I'm connected to, as we would normally see. So let's say uh, I need to find out what version all these are. So let's do a simple uh, select add at version here. And if we run that, we get our uh, result back here. Well, it's a lot of flashing. It's real pretty looking there. I don't know if that's flashing that bad on your guys' end or not. Yes, it's still flashing. Okay. Let me close and reopen. I think that's a, one of those virtual machine anomaly things. Okay, so looking at this, what it did is it actually did both. Now remember, I told you this was simultaneous, right? So we've got a, it, didn't, it didn't go hit demo one and a demo insta one. It actually did them simultaneously. So it created a connection and, and grabbed them both at the same time. But it adds the server name column so we know which server that result came back from, and it gives us the result. So I can see I'm on 20, uh, SQL Server 2012. 64-bit uh, on both of those instances. So that's kind of cool, right? We can go in and, and uh, grab information uh, from multiple servers at a time. It can also be a little dangerous. <clears throat> what if I were dropping a table and I happen to think that I was um, maybe my prod and dev? You know, for me, I might not be able to connect all of them at the same time. For you, they might be in the same domain. I don't know. The next thing you know, you've gone in here and you've dropped the table, thinking you dropped it in test, and you were actually connected to production and test and dev, all three at the same time. 
So there's a definite danger factor in here as well as the fact that it can be extremely useful to be able to query multiple servers at one time. Uh, last thing I'll show you here is uh, I told you we could import export. So what I'm going to do is I want to delete these guys first and delete the connections that I created earlier. Now I told you that if I already had a bunch of them, which I do, I've got three here registered locally, and I wanted to create them in my CMS, and I didn't want to have to do this all over again, then I could go in and export those. Uh, so what I will point out here is this first one is just a connection to my local demo one instance. Okay, he, he's using Windows authentication. Okay, nothing fancy going on here. This second one is also connected to my default demo one instance, but this guy's running SQL auth as opposed to Windows auth. And then the last one here is inst01. Okay, again Windows authentication, but this is against my name instance. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> so I can right click, we'll go under tasks here and we'll go to export. Uh, by default it's going to export from whatever level. I could have multiple folders under my local server groups here as well. From that point down is what it's going to export. If for some reason you clicked on the wrong folder, it's giving you a second chance inside this window. I could expand this and I could go under another folder uh, if you needed to do that. So I'll click the ellipsis here and I'm just going to just a local file that I've got here in my temporary folder. Uh, what's interesting here, and this is what really piqued my interest when I first looked at it, was this checkbox. This says, do not include, oops, I was hoping I would make a box there. Do not include usernames and passwords in the export file. Sounds like a good thing. Check by default. But you know what? I want to know what happens in a worst case scenario. Let's uncheck that. And I'll click OK. Of course, the file I've run this, and I've done this before, it says it already exists. Let's overwrite it. Yes. Tells me my export was successful. Well, let's go see what that guy looks like. So go in here to ctemp on my temp folder. This is the, the file. Now, this is a beautiful, gorgeous looking file because it's all XML. Who doesn't love that? So let me scroll through here and find the pieces I want to point out because that will make your life a whole lot easier because nobody wants to have to search through this. All right. So the first one that I'm going to run across here is the connection to demo one, but it was my SQL auth. So this is my local default instance, but this was a SQL authenticated connection, not the first one I want to take a look at, right? So when I get in here and I look, let me highlight this part. Okay, exposes my server name, demo1. Happens to also expose the user ID, CMS user. Now, for a lot of people, that might not be a big deal, but I've worked with some folks before that work in some of the government uh, departments, and that is a problem for them. To even have a username sitting out anywhere in clear text, that's a problem. So if that's your issue, then you need to be aware of that. Okay? And you'll notice the password's right next to it. And the password, of course, and it scrolls way off the screen. This guy right, right underneath the red line here scrolls way off the screen. That is not encrypted. Uh, in fact, if we uh, – if I scroll over here. Technically speaking, it actually tells me connected string with encrypted password. That's not encrypted. It's just a hashed value. Even though it uses the word encrypted, it is not. So that's what happens to a SQL authenticated connection. So let's go take a look at what happens to a Windows authenticated. We have two of them here, right? But we're only going to look at one. We just want to see what it, what it does. The story here is a little bit better. I can see my server name still exposed. This is that named instance. But we use trusted connection equals true here. So there's no username and there's no password because we're just using the trusted connection. We're using Windows authentication here. It's handling all of that for us at the operating system level. So that's a good thing to know. I don't have to worry about it if it happens to be Windows off. Uh, if it's SQL auth, 
then I need to be aware that, hey, you know, that username is actually exporting. So now we've exported it. Let's re-import that guy. And I, let's just put it under the prod folder here. So I'll right-click here. We'll go to task. We'll go to import. Uh, what file do you want to import? I'm going to point it to that one we just exported, of course. Uh, if you click the wrong folder, you have a second chance here on the window to expand your folders and stick it wherever you want to stick it at. And we'll click OK. Ah, well, we get an error message. But we've seen this guy before. You cannot add a shared registered server with the same name as a configuration server. OK, well, that makes sense. Why? Because that connection object there, demo1, is the same as my CMS that I'm trying to create it on. So it's going to barf at that point. Now, a few things to note here. This one was kind of a bad example because it, when you export them, they're in a random order. It didn't necessarily export them as demo1, demo1 SQL auth, and demo1 insta1. In fact, if you looked at the file we just looked at, these second two were reversed. They weren't in this order. So they're exported in a random order. They are also imported in a random order out of that XML file. This is not starting at the top and reading all the way to the bottom. If you do it enough, you'll realize that they're not coming in that way. So what happens is, is that this time, that bad connection object for demo one was the very first one. As soon as it hit it, it was done. It quit, which is why there was nothing underneath this folder. Now, had I imported it and it had been maybe the second one, the one in the middle, then it would, you would actually see the connection object for the first one in here, but nothing after the error. So anything prior to the error, it go ahead and will import that. Anything after the error, it will not. Two ways to fix this. Delete this connection object, export it, and re-import it all over again, or go through that nasty XML file and actually... Uh, Go to that nasty XML file and rip it out yourself. Not that pretty to go rip it out yourself. So unless you really want to just have a really fun day, that's not really the way you want to go. So keep all of that in mind. All right. So let's back over here to the slide deck. So getting into policy-based management, this is kind of the same idea as a central management server, whereas it gives us a central location in order to um, manage all of our SQL servers from. The interesting thing about policy-based management is that it was really designed to run locally on your local box, which means that if you wanted this set of policies, uh, you would have to create it on server one, and then you would have to go recreate it on server two and recreate it on server three. Out of the box, that's how it was designed. Good news is, is we can use CMS, and I'll show you later, to where we can make that uh, a lot more extensible, where instead of just creating it on every box, we can create on one box and then evaluate those against multiples without having to do uh, the creation of every one of them. But the good thing about this is, is it lets me take a bunch of settings and a bunch of configuration options, and I can enforce those as a standard across my enterprise. That's a great thing because that means that every single SQL server that supports Exchange is going to have these settings. And every single SQL server that supports App 1 is going to have these settings. And if they support App 2, it's going to have these settings. Maybe test stuff needs to look like this, but production needs to look like this. So we can define all these configuration settings, put them in a policy, and send the policy down to these boxes which is a great, great, awesome thing to be able to do because then I can ensure that every one of them is configured absolutely identical. And more importantly, if they ever get changed, it'll change it back and I'll know about it. That's a cool thing. Requirements. Has, this came out in SQL Server 2008, so you need to be in 2008 or above. It will run in standard enterprise or developer. Technically speaking, you will see policy-based management in Express Edition. You can actually go in there and create policies, but that's it. You can't turn it on. You can't do anything else with it. So and for me, and as far as I am concerned, Express Edition is not what I would ever use for this. It's not what I would consider supported. So you need to be in standard enterprise or developer edition to do that. Now, that just means the 
just like CMS had to be on 2008, that means it's where the PBM box needs to be. So I'm creating all my policies on that, enabling policy-based management has to be 08 or above. However, I can still evaluate policies against SQL 2000 and 2005 instances. Again, everything stored in MSDB. Make sure you're backing up your MSDB. The last thing you want is to lose that guy when you've got hundreds of settings and configurations and policies going on, and you lose them all. So just want to familiarize you with some of the terminology uh, as I go through this so some things make sense. The facet will actually make more sense when I show it to you. A facet is a certain particular aspect of SQL Server. It is the way that Microsoft has decided to group things together. So that may be tables, that may be stored procedures, that might be um, a lot of different things. Triggers, it could be a bunch of different things. I'll show you some of those so you have an idea of what the facets look like and how Microsoft has organized that. Condition. Conditions are actually used for the rest of these other things, but those are what I'm looking for and what I'm trying to target. The policy is nothing more than a container. It contains everything else that we see here. It contains the conditions, it contains the targets, those types of things. A target is what server I'm looking for. Maybe I want to target, uh, it, you know, server, these particular five servers here. Uh, maybe I want to target one for only a particular version. Uh, we can do that with server restrictions. We can also do categories. So that's, an, usually my good example there is uh, PCI, SOX, those types of things. If I have a bunch of policies that they need to apply to, um, maybe I've got 15 policies and in order to be SOX compliant, they need to be all 15. I could put those 15 in this category. And then I can say, hey, look, this category needs to be applied. And then I am sure that it'll be SOX compliant. So very handy. A few ways to create these policies, uh, we can do it manually, uh, either through the GUI or T-SQL. Uh, this is one of the few times that I tell folks yeah, GUI is perfectly fine to use here. The only reason to ever really not use a GUI, uh, and I realize that so many people tell you not to, is really based upon what the GUI hides from you. And a lot of times, the GUI hides a lot of stuff. There is nothing in PBM that the GUI is hiding from you. There's no options that you'll find through the T-SQL that are not available in the GUI. In fact, most of the T-SQL stuff, and I have them listed here, are undocumented. So my suggestion is if the T-SQL can be great because it allows me to uh, rerun it multiple times, right? So what I can do is I can actually create it through the GUI. When I get to the very end of the GUI, I can script it out. That's the better way to do it. Don't rewrite it yourself. Don't waste your time. Uh, when we do it, uh, there's a few rules. We always do the check condition first. That's what you're looking for. Uh, then we will create the policy and add the, the condition to it. Uh, then we define our target conditions. Uh, evaluation mode, we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute uh, in any server restriction conditions that we may have. The other way to create a policy is to import it. So if it already exists, we can import it. Uh, we can import it from other servers. Uh, Microsoft also has some best practice policies out there. Um, they're, they're not already imported for you. You have to import them yourself, but they're already installed. The, the files are sitting out there ready for you uh, by default SQL Server installation. Uh, you don't need to write down uh, the path there. Um, when you open up the GUI and you go to open up our best practice policy, it will automatically open you to that folder itself, and I'll show you that. When you do an import, there's a few options to be aware of. Replace duplicates with items imported. Okay. That guy's a little bit of a double whammy. And the reason I say that is because it's nice that they're, they're imported. So let's say um, policy one, I suspect a junior DBA went and made some changes too because it's been sitting out there for six months. I'm getting some weird results from it, and I think there may have been some alterations to it. So what I can do is, is if I have a copy of it that I exported as a backup, then I can re-import that policy right on top of it, and it will overwrite it. Okay, well, that seems great. That way I can refresh it and put it right back where it was. The negative to that is that every time you evaluate a policy in your environment, the SQL Server keeps a history of that so that you can go look at the history of the evaluations and their results. 
Well, the pl on one hand, it seems great that it keeps the history. It does not wipe the history out when you tell it to replace it. However, even though it doesn't wipe the history out, how legitimate is that history if that junior DBA changed a setting? Now that history is not so legitimate anymore because it's based upon different criteria than what it was originally designed to do. So keep that in mind, kind of a good thing, kind of a bad thing. Uh, and we can overwrite the state. So the interesting thing is when you export it, uh, whether uh, preserve state means that however it was exported is how it's going to come back in. So if you had a policy that was disabled and you exported it, when you import it, it's going to come back in in that exact same state. It's going to come back in in the disabled state. Uh, same thing uh, for enabled and disabled. It's the same deal. You're just overriding everything. So no matter how, whether it was enabled or disabled, we can override it and bring it in. I have stars around disabled, and I have it there for a reason. I encourage you to always bring it in disabled. There's no reason not to because all you have to do is right-click and turn it on to enable it. Right? It's not some huge ordeal to turn it on. It's very simple. So bring it in in a disabled state. Look at it. Review it. Make sure with on a shadow of a doubt that it is doing what it says it's going to do and it behaves how you expect it in your environment before you turn it on. So evaluation modes, we've got four of them here. I really kind of consider the last two, I kind of lump them together just because of the way they behave. So the first one's on demand, and that's just a manual mode. It literally means I went in, I right-clicked on a policy, I said evaluate it, and immediately evaluate it on my server. On schedule means that I am letting SQL agent do it. Uh, I can put it on a schedule, and SQL agent will go out and evaluate that policy against the server on whatever schedule I sell it to. Now the two on changes, the reason I kind of lump, tend to lump those together is because those are reactionary. They respond to a DDL event. So when a DDL event gets raised, that's when these guys run, and two things either happen. One is it log only, just logs it. It says, look, this event happened. I, it violated the policy, and I'm making a mental note of it and logging it for you. I didn't do anything else. I didn't stop it from happening. I didn't reverse it. I didn't do anything like that. Prevent, however, although the, the word prevent here is actually a little bit of a misnomer, and I'll give you a little bit more of the in, I'll explain the internals. I'm not going to get depth of the internals, but prevent, in theory, is supposed to prevent that action from happening. In all honesty, it doesn't actually prevent it. It actually allows it to happen, rolls it inside of a transaction. When it realizes that it violates a policy, it rolls it back. So if it happens to be some type of action that has a large impact uh, to your server, then that rollback, you've got to wait for that rollback to occur. But it doesn't actually prevent it from occurring. It actually lets it happen and undoes it. Right? It's like a bad crash recovery. So there's some methods of how we can evaluate these as well. Uh, out of the box, if I right-click a policy and I say evaluate, it'll evaluate that policy against that instance. But I can also select multiple policies and evaluate them on that instance, so I don't have to do it one at a time. Now I can do a single policy and I can evaluate that against multiple instances. I have to have a CMS to do that. Okay. If you don't have a central management server, you can't do that. Same for doing multiple policies against multiple instances. If I have five policies and want to run against three different servers, I can do that, but I have to have a central management server in order to do that. All right, let's jump into a demo. I still want to see how this guy lands. I'm really curious to see how it worked out. I'm going to assume that will. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to combine the next two demos. We're going to kind of do them all together here. All right, so let's close some of the CMS stuff here. So let me go to Object Explorer, uh, my local default instance here, and policy-based management is under this management node. So if we expand the management node, then we find policy management, the very first one here. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that it's red. So by default, this guy is actually disabled. It's not turned on, so we have to enable it and turn it on. 
That's easy enough to do. Right click, enable, done. Ready to go. Now, this should be empty. How good it is, I cleaned it up. No policies, no conditions here by default. There are a bunch of facets I want to expand on the view. Let me go over here and let's do let's view the property window here. So as you can see, there's quite a list of different facets here, but it kind of gives you an idea of how they break it up, right? So these are settings that affect a database. If I look at it, open it up, I can see things that affect the database might be the mirroring timeout status if you're doing mirroring. Uh, who's the owner? Is it in read only? How about the recovery model? What recovery model is that? That's a good one. Uh, maybe I want to get alert when space available gets to a certain place. Maybe one particular user accesses it. So there's a lot of different things that we can do, uh, settings and things that we can check. And they've got it broken up. I mean, there's stuff that we can look at, uh, you know, different things for file groups, indexes, the log file, uh, logins to the server. Uh, you know, if we scroll down, there's going to be tables and triggers, all user-defined functions and types, all different kinds of things. So this kind of gives you a better idea of, of what a fast is. There's different aspects of SQL Server. This is how Microsoft kind of uh, arrange things. So if we're going to create a policy, and let's create a policy that says auto-create statistics, I want it to be turned on in all of my databases. So how would we do that? The first thing we'll do is I'll right-click and I'll do New Policy. I'll just right-click the Policies node, do New Policy. The very first thing is defined here. You'll see there's a couple red dots here in the first two. We have to have a name. Uh, so I'll just call this uh, Auto Create Stats. And the other one is a condition. Now, there's nothing in the drop-down box. We haven't created one, but we can click on New Conditions. So that's the first thing that's required is creating a new condition. What are we looking for? Let's call this auto stats. And so um, database options, let's see, database is what we're looking for. That's where we're going to go. And this guy's a little hard to see. Oh, yeah, let's see. True. So you can kind of see we're building out this expression here in the bottom. So I, I picked the field of auto create statistics enabled. I want it to be enabled, so I want it to be true. Operators equal is true. These operator option values, right now, I would, if I showed it to you, the equals and not equals, it depends on the field. There are other operators available, but they will automatically just show you the ones that are available for whatever field this happens to be. I can build the expression out further and add more lines here if I want to. But for right now, auto create statistics, I want it to be true. I click OK. Here's the targets. What do you want to evaluate that against? Well, I want to do it against every database on my server, not just two of them or one of them. I want all of them. So that's fine. Here's that evaluation mode we talked about. The drop down here only has two of them, though. It only has on demand and on schedule. It doesn't have those other two for on chain. So the reason behind that is that the event has to raise a DDL event. If it doesn't raise a DDL event, then I can't do that. But taking it further beyond that is that you saw that every one of these facets could have 10 settings, 15, 30 settings. Every single setting inside of a facet has to raise a DDL event for the on-change options to be available here. So I tell you that because you may go in and find a condition that you want to set, and you know for a fact. You can prove it and trace it, that it raises a DDL event. But for some reason, on-change is not an available evaluation mode. The reason for that is because there's at least one other setting inside that same facet that doesn't raise a DDL event. So it's an all-or-none situation. Now, the good news is, is some of these settings are available in multiple facets. So even though you might not be able to do it in one, you might want to look to see if that option is available in a different facet somewhere else. Hey, For this Ryan. example, yeah. Uh, we're coming up at 1 o'clock, and um, I just wanted to give people the opportunity to ask questions if they could, if, if they had to uh, leave at this point. 
Um, so we have uh, uh, Jeff Simmons here is uh, in person, and we have uh, Michael who's attending via WebEx. Uh, guys, do you have any questions? I would be interested in seeing a little bit more um, about the reporting. Okay. Is that something you're going to cover, Ryan? Oh, I, I couldn't. He faded out toward the end, so I didn't hear the whole question. Oh. Um, in, in the introduction, you said that you were going to talk about uh, the reporting capabilities of the policy management, and I'd kind of like to see what those are. Yeah, that came across really garbled in a while. Greg, can you repeat it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so he was wondering if you're going to cover reporting. Yes, at the very end. I'm, I'm not going to get super in-depth with reporting, but I'm just going to show you uh, how you can do that. Okay. All right, well, um, carry on. All right. So uh, let's see, where were we? So I'm not going to define any server restrictions down here. We'll go ahead and click OK. And I'll, in the interest of time, I'll speed up a little bit here, but I'll get make sure that we get through and, and show you guys some of this stuff. Of course, the recording will be available for you afterward, too. So. All right, so this auto create statistics, so I've created my policy. Now, you're going to notice that it's got a red down arrow. So this thing's disabled by default. Well, anything you create that's on demand will always be that way, and that's fine. Um, when we get to the alert section, it'll make a little bit more sense why it is the way that it is. Uh, but it's perfectly fine to be disabled. So what I can do is I can right-click and I can do evaluate. And a couple things happen here when I do this. So it immediately evaluates it against the local server. And so I can look at my results down here, uh, and I've got a few databases. Let me expand this guy a little bit so we can see everything in here. Uh, I can see that this one here failed. Okay, So if I click the view, uh, that's, that's in blue, so I, it's a hyperlink I can click. It will actually tell me up here in the top, hey, autocrate statistics enable uh, – I expected it to be true, but the actual value was false, so that's why. Now, that's not like, like duh, right? I mean, that's not overly informative right here, but there are some policies where you can actually uh, do something based upon a value where that value is not just a true or false. We're not looking at something that's Boolean. We're actually looking at a legitimate value. That becomes a lot more useful to look at uh, when you write a policy like that, so although it's not overly – uh, enthralling here, uh, it certainly has its use later on. Now, if you look at these databases here, you're going to notice that most of these are user databases, right? But there's a few that are missing. Master, model, MSDB, all the system databases are not here. Hmm, that's kind of odd. Why is that odd? Well, when I created this policy, let me open it back up again. That guy says every database. You also notice it's a blue hyperlink, so let's click on it. And if you can see that, I'm clicking vigorously, and it is doing nothing. Anytime you click on something in here that does nothing, it means that it was a default built-in policy. Don't trust it. Just because it says every doesn't mean it does every. It clearly did not. It clearly filtered out the system databases. And this is why I say always check every policy and everything that comes in, no matter where it came in from, to make sure that it's going to behave exactly how you expect it. So to fix this, we can actually create another condition here. So what we can do is I click the down arrow. I can do new condition, and let's say uh, I'll call this user and system databases. Uh, we'll stick with the database facet. There's a field in here called is system object. Is system object. I'm actually going to build out an expression here. So, and then we'll change this one to false. So if it's false, I need to change, I want to change this to an or. So if it's false, or if it's true, I want to include it. So whether it's a system object or not, I want to include it. Click OK. Click OK. Let's evaluate it again. 
And what do we get? Expand our target tier. Sure enough, there's tempdb there at the bottom. Here's master at model. So just be careful of those things. Now, the other neat thing here is you'll notice there's a checkbox. If I check the checkbox, the apply button is no longer grayed out, and I can click apply. If I click apply, it says applying the policy modifies the selected targets that don't comply. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. Two things happen. One, it changes the setting. Two, it actually reevaluates the policy just to make sure that the setting actually did get changed. So that's a cool deal. And as I can see, it reran the evaluation. Everything came back green. The database I was looking at was PBM1. If I were to actually go look at that guy and look at auto create statistics option, sure enough, auto create statistics is now true where it was false before. So it actually changes the system setting. So that's kind of a cool thing. Now, I also told you that we could import policies. So if I right click and I do import, it will auto, and as soon as I click on this ellipsis, it takes me right to the folder that I, it'll actually take me to this folder by default. And so I have policies here uh, from Microsoft, some best practice policies against analysis services, reporting services, and the database engine, what's we're gonna, what we're going to look at now. We'll go into database engine 1033. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a decent list of them in here. I'm going to do database auto shrink. This is those um, options we talked about earlier. Replace duplicates with items imported. Remember, it retains the history. Uh, and then here's the policy state. So this one says by default to preserve, but I can change that if I remember. Always bring it in in a disabled state with my rule of thumb to make sure it does what you want it to do. So I'm going to click OK and import it. Now I can see that the policy got created, but there's multiple conditions. Auto stats, user and system DB, those were mine, but these other three are not. These are what just got imported with the auto shrink. So they've used three different conditions to create this policy with. Let's go see what it looks like. All right, so it's on demand is manual, so it's not enabled. The check condition, auto shrink disabled. Let's go look at the check condition, see what it's looking for. It's looking that the auto shrink, using the database performance facet, auto shrink needs to be false. I want auto shrink to be off. Great. It is going to check online user databases. If I click it, I, it actually does something this time. It opens up the condition. So that wasn't a default out of the box. Even though it was already here, we still imported it. It wasn't actually a default policy that was already inside SQL Server. That's why we were able to open this one. And we can see that it used is system object is false, which means that I'm automatically filtering out any of the system databases. And the status of the database needs to be a normal. Okay, no problem there. They also included our server restriction down here called Enterprise or Standard Edition. All right, cool. Let's click OK. Let's go ahead and run this guy and see what happens. There we go. I have one of them where auto shrink is actually turned on. Expect it to be false. My, my value was actually true. Now, I'm not going to go ahead, because uh, I want to show this to you later, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go ahead and apply the setting. I'm not going to make the change right now. So that's pretty cool. One other thing I want to show you here that's interesting, just to prove a point. Let's take a look at the server restriction here. Enterprise or standard edition. Let's click the ellipsis here and look at it. So the engine edition has to be standard. Okay. This one says enterprise or developer. Well. It was called Enterprise or Standard, but the truth of the matter is, is it's really including Standard Enterprise and Developer. Maybe that matters to you, maybe it doesn't, but it just proves the point of even if it's something that was a default best practice policy from Microsoft themselves, until you look at it, you don't know how it's going to react in your environment. This may or may not be okay in your environment. Make sure you bring it in disabled and look at absolutely every single last setting and condition in the policy to ensure that it's going to do exactly what you think it's going to do.
All right. Last thing to show you is the on-chain stuff. And you like this one. This one's kind of cool. So I want to do something here that says um, I want to enforce a naming standard. I want all of my store procedures to begin with uh, USP underscore. Well, more importantly, I don't want them to look like a system store procedure. I don't want them to begin with SP underscore. So let's see how we can do that. I'm just going to call it SP naming. We need to create a condition, so we'll do a, a new condition called SP name. Obviously, it's the name of a store procedure, so the facet. That one's pretty obvious. We're going to use the store procedure facet. Get us all our options for store procedures. Uh, we, we're looking at the name of a store procedure, so the field, also pretty obvious, is going to be the name field. Now, here we have a few more operators available to us. Equals, not equals, like, in, not like, not in. I'm going to use the like. And I'm going to say it needs to look like USP underscore. I don't care what it is after that. I use a wild card with a percent sign, but I want USP underscore. It has to start with that anytime a store product gets created. And we'll click OK for that condition. Uh, so again, these targets, every store procedure, if I click on it, it does nothing. Every database, click on it, again, it does nothing, which means that they very well may not behave the way that I think they do. We already know for a fact every database doesn't. It only does user databases. For us, for this example, that's fine for now. It's the evaluation mode we want to look at, though. So I'm going to use on change prevent. You'll notice that they're available now. As soon as I do that, and this is so easy to forget, this enabled box right here, it was grayed out until the second I clicked on change. That applies for anything you, whether it's uh, for on change log only, on change prevent, or uh, on schedule. As soon as you select any of those, enable will be turned on. If you forget to enable this, you will sit here and you will run this policy and you will never see anything happen. It does not yell at you and tell you that it's not enabled. It just does nothing and dies silently. You have to turn this guy on or you will never get alerts on anything. That's easy to forget. Try and remember that. I'm not going to do any server restrictions here. Description, this one's a little interesting. I'm just going to type in the description field, my description, just so I can show you where this shows up here in a minute. I'll show you where they show up here in a minute. All right, so now we've got that thing going on. So let's do this. Let's open up a new query. Actually, you know what, I've already got to save myself some time here. So this says I'm going to use the PBM2 database. I'm going to create a procedure called SPPBM check. Uh, Ryan, well, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you put this on a central management server, does this mean you can push this out to all of your managed servers? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I'm getting to that here in a minute. I haven't quite gotten that far yet. Um, right now we're just, yeah, right now we're just here locally on this server. But in order for us to get out further and apply it to other servers, I'll show you that here in a minute. So we said that it has to start with USP underscore. Well, that doesn't start with USP underscore. It starts with SP underscore. So I should see a failure here. So we'll go ahead and click Execute. So this guy comes back, and he comes back with some interesting information that's worth looking at. He tells me, hey, a policy got violated. Gives me the name of the policy here, SP name. The transaction will be rolled back, which is literally what it will do. Remember, it doesn't really prevent anything. It actually wraps it up inside CLR in a transaction, and it will roll it back. Policy condition. So the good thing is, is it tells me right here, hey, this is what you were supposed to do. The name needed to be like USP underscore. The description. So if you wanted to put something in the description that says, hey, 
you know, this is not what you're supposed to do. It's supposed to look like this, so make sure you name it like this. You can put whatever you need to in here. Additional help, you say, hey, developer, stop doing this, and then there's a link in here. So the cool thing is, is with this link, we can put a link to the help desk in here that says, look, these are, you violated a naming convention. If you need more information on how to properly create your store procedures according to our naming convention, click this link to go to the help desk where there's an article telling you what our naming convention is so that you can comply. So that's pretty cool information, right? And of course, it actually tells me the statement here as well. So this whole section here is the statement that actually got run, so it tells me what statement I ran that violated the policy. Kind of neat. So uh, talking about running stuff on multiple servers, let's talk about that for a minute. And this is where the CMS comes in handy. I'm going to uh, I'm going to put my registrations back. We removed them, so I'm just going to add these back real quick. So I added both my instances here. This is where PBM becomes powerful because up until now, all this stuff has been local on that one box, that demo one box default instance. But if on this prod folder, if I right click on this, there's an evaluate policies option here. So let me do that. It says uh, choose your source. So it says it's where are your policies located at? Now you could point it to a file location because you actually export your locations, put them on a file share and point it there. But for me, I'm actually storing them on that demo one instance, so I'm just going to point to the demo one instance, click OK, and it's going to pull up every policy that's on here. Some of these are a bunch of default built-in policies um, that they already have created for always on. Uh, my three that I, we created here are down toward the end. So here's the auto create stats, database auto shrink, and the SP naming one here at the end. I can run one. I can check all three of them, and I can run all three. So if I click evaluate here, and let's go back up and look at the first one. So auto create stats. This very first section from the row I have highlighted up is all that named instance. But then you'll notice from there down, it didn't use my friendly name. It started using that local look back, you know, see the 12701 below that line? That's the other instance of SQL Server. So I just evaluated this policy against two instances of SQL Server, which could have been two completely different servers. They happen to both be running on the same box, but it could have been two completely different servers. So it actually evaluated that policy against every single server. That is super cool. And we can see that we had two on that named instance, PBM3 database, PBM4 that violated this policy. If I scroll down, everything else looked good. If I do the database auto shrink, Look, I had two of them that failed on the name instance and one on my local default instance that failed. So that's kind of cool. That's how I can use CMS to make PBM be a lot more extensible and run it against multiple servers. All right. Uh, one other thing I'm going to show you, and I'm going to skip ahead of the slide deck and just show you this piece of the demo real quick. As we talked about alerting, so what happens And there's only four alerts here, but this is what one of the alerts look like. You notice I've got four created, and I've got them here in the slide deck. I'll show you in a minute. They're pretty simple. So on change log only against all databases, you know, right here, and look for this error number. That's it. All I got to do is set up uh, against this error number, and anything that's an on change log only that happens to uh, violate my policy then I can set up an alert to that, and then I can go in here and say, you know, email me or do whatever we need to do. Very cool, handy thing. I'll show you the numbers here in a minute. But as you can see, there's only four here. And I know that, uh, let's see, but you notice the manual is not in here, but let's take a look at the prevent automatic. So if I right-click here, Oh, I'm sorry. So in order to get that history, we'd actually have to go to uh, like SP naming. I'm going to right click and I can do view history. You can see the history of every evaluation. So we've only run it once, but these were the results. 
and it's more or less what the GUI would show you, but not as pretty when you look at it from here. Uh, but it will tell you, hey, look, you ran the SB naming convention policy. Uh, you had an error. It violated it. Uh, this is what the SP, uh, PBM check was what you tried to create. It didn't work. And then all the other data is just in this beautiful XML. It's not that pretty to look at. Although up here in the details column, if I click the hyperlink, then I get that same window that says, hey, look, um, I expected this to be USP underscore, but the actual value was this. So now you can also see that that actual value column, it's got a little bit more meaning now than just a Boolean true false, right? Hey, Ryan, I have a question. Um, so yeah. I am a SQL consultant, and so if I was to go on site and uh, assess somebody's SQL environment, uh, what kind of permissions uh, would I need to run these policies? Is it sysadmin or uh, something less? Uh, yeah, so in order to run this, yeah, you'd have to have sysadmin for that in order to run all of these, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think some of the policies, and that's where, so for you, importing and exporting would be huge, right, where you go in and you can create all these on your laptop the way you want them to look. And you've got them stored in a folder. Then when you get to a client site, then I can import them into their server and go ahead and evaluate those. So that's kind of a plus the import exporting thing. All right, so let's flip back to the slide deck here. Try and finish up here real quick. Uh, so here are the alerts. Uh, if you're going to set up alerts, of course, there's the, just the basic requirements to remember. Set up database mail, create your operators, make sure you go into agent and change the alert notification system to, to your database mail profile. Uh, and then the policy has to be enabled to raise an alert. So which means that you, we couldn't enable ones that were on demand. So if we were to go in and have a, you know, uh, an evaluation of a policy that was on demand and we did it manually and it violated it, then we would not get an email on that. And that's okay. I don't want an email because I'm running it manually. I'm looking at it. I'm seeing the results instantly on demand. So why would I want to get an email? But again, remember that if you change it from on demand to something else, if you don't check that enable box, it'll actually run and not record anything. So make sure you check that enable box. Here are the PBM error numbers. You guys can go out to my blog, by the way. Um, click on presentations up at the top of my blog at ryanjadams.com, and you can pull the slide deck down if you don't want to write down like these numbers. If you have these four numbers, then you'll get alerted to every single violation that can possibly happen. Um, on schedule makes sense. The one there at the bottom makes the most sense. On change log only makes sense. Well, on change prevents kind of interesting though because you'll see there's one called automatic parentheses and one called is on demand. And so when we did that SP naming one, that would have been considered automatic. I tried to create a stored proc with the wrong naming convention. So I triggered it by that DDL event. It happened automatically and prevented it. That would have been a 34050. However, you'll also notice, remember, when I went in and I ran them manually, you can still run something that's set for on change prevent manually without it actually occurring because those stored procs, that's only good from that point going forward. When I tried, I created the policy, then did the proc, and then had the failure. That policy didn't go check every single stored procedure that already existed, nor will it. Not on demand. That's where you would have to go do it manually yourself to see if there's stuff that already exists before you created the policy that happened to violate it. That would have been a 34051 because you ran it manually as opposed to it occurring as a reaction to a DDL event. So the reporting thing, um, I, I wasn't really going to get too in-depth on this because you have to go play with this. It's really simple. So if you go out to codeplex.com, it's called Enterprise Policy Management Framework. Uh, it's a really cool framework. It's a great place to start with. And what this thing will let you do, uh, and it, these lists of requirements sound pretty harsh when you look at it. You're looking at, oh, okay, well, I have to have 2008 SP1, CU3 or above. That's probably not such a big deal. Need to have PBM, need to have CMS at this point. If I'm writing reports, I probably have those two. So, so far, so good. PowerShell, okay, I need to have that installed. Hmm, a management database and SQL reporting services. Now I've got to create a database to store this stuff, and then I've got to create reports on all of it. And so that sounds like a tall order. There's a good chunk of time there. The good thing is, is when you download it, the setup includes all of that. 
It will give you a SQL script to create the database for you. Uh, it will come with a PowerShell script that will allow you to evaluate, evaluate the policies. Because remember, we I went in and right-clicked in our, my CMS in order to evaluate that policy against multiple servers. That's great to do it manually, but in order for me to do it on schedule and actually schedule that out to be automated, I would have to use a PowerShell command in order to do that. It's worth downloading the Enterprise Policy Management Framework just to see how they did it and basically, quote unquote, steal their code. And it's just a real simple one-liner PowerShell command of how to run and evaluate a policies against your CMS. And it's pretty cool because you don't have to run it against every server on the CMS. You can actually define what folder you want to run it at, so it'll run from that folder down, which is pretty neat. And it comes with a full bids reporting project. So it's got all the reports. The whole solutions are there. You can just import those into Visual Studio, make a couple of changes uh, for some of the metrics you want to look at, which they fully document. There's only like two or three changes, very minimal, and then just deploy those out to your reporting server. Um, I already did the demo. Uh, just a few use cases. You guys can look over these on your own time, but the, it's really handy. I mean, it looks at auto shrink, but I mean, think about, you know, is auto grow on? Not only is it on, but what is it set for? You know, is my database mail turned on? Maybe I don't want it. Maybe I don't want XP command shell to be turned on. Uh, certain recovery models. When was the last time things got backed up? You know, are my are my transaction logs and my data log files, are they on different uh, different drives? So there's a million different things that we can look at that are really, really cool. Uh, so just in summary, some of the things we went over, we talked about CMS, how do we configure it, how do we import and export, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, policy creation, uh, how do we create them? We looked at where we were supposed to go find it at, the three different valuation modes to evaluate those, uh, some the alerts, we need those just as four simple alerts so we get notified of any violation that occurs. And then, uh, of course, the enterprise management uh, framework there. And I, I thought I had a, uh, thought I had a slide on what that EPMF looked like. appear that I don't. I'm going to let that run. I'll take a minute to pull this report out. Uh, while that's pulling up, though, a few uh, resources for you. A uh, really good book written by Ken Simmons, Colin Stasek, and Jorge Segarra. All three of these guys are great. Um, I personally know two of the three. And uh, they, they're all on Twitter, so you can follow them on Twitter. They all blog, so you can find some great information out about uh, policy-based management. If you're looking to uh, implement this stuff, this is a fantastic book. It's not a big book. It's a real easy read, uh, and it covers it. Uh, even though it's a small book, it covers it extremely well. So I highly suggest uh, taking a look at that book there. Uh, if you go to my blog there, ryanjadams.com uh, slash presentations, or just go there and click presentations, you can grab the slide deck from there. Um, and, of course, I'm on Twitter and blog and stuff as well. Let me see if this pulled up yet. Here we go. Let me go full screen here. So when I go into EPM policy reports, it's got five reports that come as part of the solution. Uh, the first four are actually drill-down reports, uh, depending on what you click in, in the policy dashboard. The dashboard is really the one you want to take a look at. Now, of course, this isn't going to be fancy awesome because we won't exactly have a ton of stuff going on in this box being a demo box. This isn't going to be the most uh, revolutionary type piece of information, but at least give you an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, so I can tell, hey, look, I've got two policies that are in a failed state. Uh, you know, 5% of my policies have failed. And if I go down here, I can actually dig into this last execution status. It'll actually tell me, like, this 12701 was my local uh, default instance. I can tell you that I only had an error here on the PBM2 database. I can dig in a little bit further. It tells me the name of the policy was database auto shrink and it failed. And, of course, there's other metrics here. I failed policies by month, how many failed on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, how, for particular policies, uh, what's the percentage of those that have passed or failed for particular policies? And you can click on all this stuff and dig in further. Uh, but just really, really cool thing to, to be aware of and take a look at. It's a cool, easy project to deploy.
All right, so that's all I have. Anybody have any questions for me? Uh, we are all out of questions here. Uh, Michael said, uh, interesting talk. It's a little over his head. Um, he has no questions. Or maybe he has questions now, but I don't know. All right, fascinating talk. I, I uh, had mentioned before, um, I never got around to really uh, getting into the central management server, you know, policy-based management stuff, but I'm definitely going to be using it now because it looks really easy to set up, you know? Yeah, it's a really simple, easy thing, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, it's, it's just pretty simple, easy thing. It's worth it. It's just good to get those configuration standards to be consistent across an inter enterprise. And for me, working in a large shop, it makes life a whole lot easier to make sure that all my boxes look exactly the same. And what's better is, is that if some junior DBA goes and changes it, it'll change it right back. <laughs> so that's a real handy thing. Got to watch out for those junior DBAs. Yeah, never know what you're getting into. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we got a bail here. Um, thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, doing your presentation. We really appreciate it. And uh, is there is that yeah, link there, no speaker problem. rate? Is that to rate your performance? Oh, I, I honestly, I meant to take that out of here. Oh. I don't actually use that anymore. Okay. Well, <laughs> you get five stars in my book. Ah, thank you. <laughs> appreciate it. Good deal. Well, hey, anytime you need somebody, just give me a shout. I, I swear my other stuff's shorter than an hour and a half. <laughs> okay. Well, I will take up on that. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you all for coming to the Alaska SQL User Group. Um, and uh, next month, as I've mentioned, we're going to be covering um, some of the more built-in features of a SQL Server uh, to make your enterprise sing. Uh, you can, this uh, session will, will be recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. And uh, thanks again to Global Beat for letting us use their music. Uh, that'll be added in post. It's kind of a cool music. Um, and until then, we'll see you next month.